Say what's cracking YouTube? It's your boy 16 to life and I'm back like I'm on a pro violation. Yard down. Now for those of y'all that's new to my page, in 1994 I got arrested. I was eventually sentenced to 16 years plus life and I served 24 years straight in the California prison system. During those times, I accumulated some good stories, some good insight on things related to the California prison system. I'm going to share some with y'all today. If you like the story, be sure to hit that like button, subscribe to the channel, leave a comment. Most importantly, hit that notification bell. That way, anytime I drop a story, you will be notified ASAP. Also, be sure to check out uh, this YouTube page. It's called Breaking Bread. They have some good um, They have some good. Segments on there called Behind the Justice. I'll try to leave a link in the comment. And if you like my free game Friday videos, we got another one coming tomorrow, man. So let's hop right up into this story. Now, due to the fact that I did have a life sentence, I often get comments, people asking me, how was I able to obtain my freedom? And so basically, um, it was a whole lot of things that had to happen in order for me and others who had life to come home. Initially in 1995, when I was sentenced to 16 years uh, plus life with the possibility of parole, uh, I never forget, I caught the chain with this dude by the name of Stymie, man. Stymie was from Hoover. Stymie was probably about 18, 19 years old. Stymie was also uh, sentenced to life with 15 years to life. He was pretty gun ho about being 18, 19 and only having 15 years to do. You know, so he done the math and said he'd be home at the age of 32, 33, whatever. You know, and he still had a lot of time in his mind to get out and get his life together. Uh, one of the first people that we saw when we got to Salinas Valley, level four, we ended up meeting this dude by the name of C. Looney, who was from Venice Showline Crip. So C. Uh, uh, C. Looney broke the news to us. He asked us, hey, man, you got life? You got life? We was telling him, yeah. He said, oh, man, y'all ain't never going nowhere. Y'all going to be walking. Uh, y'all going to be walking the yard with me. Then he went on to explain. Even though we were sentenced to life with the possibility of parole, the way that the parole board system was being ran, they was uh, systematically denying lifers. And so we wasn't going nowhere. So when you hear news like that, it definitely knocked the wind out of his cell and my cell. And it also doesn't give an individual any incentive to try to um, be good to stay out of trouble. Plus, you know, when your parole board or you see me, your parole hearing it's 15, 20 years away, and you are around all this madness. You know, I was at, I was on a level 4180, Salinas Valley, which is um, the highest level of security prison that you can be in in, in the state of California. You know, uh, I had life. Everybody I'm talking to has got life, so I'm assuming everybody up there has life. And then uh, these places are a place of spontaneous violence. So now your parole date and going home is the last thing on your mind. Your first concern and priority is surviving the moment, surviving whatever's jumping off, the fight, the uh, the fights, the riots, you know, the guards in the tower with many 14 shooting, stuff like that, you know, the stabbings. So, you know, you get caught up in this type of environment. And since you already understand or believe that you're not going home anyway, there's no incentive to be good to try to make it home. You know, my whole thing was to try to keep my reputation as a full fledged gang member, you know, especially back then. Only thing gang members had was their reputation and their word, you know. So that was my that was my most concern, you know, uh, especially by me being a small dude from an even smaller town, smaller hood. I had to I felt I had no choice but to stand up for myself, you know, because as like I said, as a gang banger. That's all you're living for is your reputation. And so, you know, uh, going home was out of the window in my mind. And then the way the system was set up, you know, like I said, the governors, the parole boards, they were systematically denying uh, people who went up for their for their for their hearings. At the time when I got to the pen, Pete Wilson was the governor. Um, I believe it was like in maybe 19, I don't know, maybe 1990, somewhere up in there, 1988. The voters in California had voted and gave the governor power. So in the event, a person who had life went to the parole board and he was found suitable. That's the term that's used. They find you suitable for parole. The governor had the final say so. So uh, once a lifer is found suitable, there's about a 120 day waiting period 
for you know it, it to go through the certain channels. Then it finally lands on the governor's desk. He reads through it and he can find any reason to revoke your suitability hearing and take your suitability hearing. And so now you basically are a lifer again and you have to go through the whole process. So if you were in prison for murder, then this is what he could do. Me, I was in, I had a life sentence for an attempted murder. Um, so I had three attempted murders and I got nine years for that. Then there was an individual who they claimed that I was trying to shoot at. And even though he was never hit, I was convicted of pre uh, premeditated attempted murder on him. And that's where I got my life sentence. Then I had a trailing murder case. So at that point, I'm sentenced to nine years plus life. Then I went on the run before I was, uh, apprehended. So by the time they caught me, not only am I wanted for these three shootings, I have another separate murder that I end up getting charged with on that murder. On the, on the three attempted murders, I went to trial and I lost on that murder. I end up taking a deal for 16 years for voluntary manslaughter. So that's how I ended up with 16 years plus a life sentence, that life sentence. So I would have to do the 16 years and then uh, I got half time. And then um, on that life sentence, I had to do seven years before I was eligible for parole. And so, uh, but by me having life for the attempted murders, the governor could not actually take my suitability hearing in the event that I was found suitable. But what he could do is recommend that my whole case go back before the um, 12 commissioners who um, who sit on the commissioner uh, commissioner panel. So when you go when a, as a lifer, when you go to your parole hearing, there's going to be uh, a deputy commissioner. It's going it's to be a commissioner, a deputy commissioner, a district attorney, your lawyer and any um, members of the victim's family in the event they choose to attend. And so uh, you're going to get questioned extensively, you know, about your crime. It's going to be a very, it's going to be a very intense, especially back, especially back in the day. It's going to be a very in intense, antagonistic, you know, questioning. They're going to be trying to eventually, uh, they're going to try to intentionally get you upset so you can explode, you know, say something anger, angry anger angrily so they can use all these things to try to deny you to try to deny you now um back then uh they did a study in between the, the years of 1990 and 2010 you had a six percent chance of being paroled and so uh like i said in the event you did get paroled the uh the governor could then reverse your suitability hearing and so it definitely was a, <clears throat> it definitely was, it definitely was a hard struggle. So eventually later on, uh, some of the things that was, that was, that was monumental in helping lifers, myself included, uh, gain their eventual freedom. There was a lady by the name, I believe her name was Sandra Davis Lawrence. And every time she would go to her parole hearing, she was in there, I believe for killing, uh, killing somebody, killing, um, killing the girlfriend of of her man or something like that but anyway they would always deny her on the viciousness of her crime so she did a she filed a lawsuit the supreme court ruled on it that her crime was never going to change so you couldn't the board couldn't continually deny her on the viciousness of her crime alone you know she had she had uh she had turned into a teacher in there helping people had gained a whole lot of um college uh degrees and stuff like that and hadn't been in any trouble, but they was using this one small reason that her crime was vicious. And so uh, the Supreme Court ruled in her favor. And of course, what what um, the ruling that applied to her also applied to all the other convicts who who was getting denied for for that particular reason. So her ruling and a few other rulings filed by lifers is one thing filed by lifers and then they was they was ruled in the favor of the convict is one thing that something that helped it helped open up the door in a major way for all all lifers you know they started revamping the parole board um stuff like that but initially uh after pete wilson you had governor gray davis i believe gray davis was in office for five years in his five-year term this dude paroled Eight lifers. You you had eight people go home between I believe 1993 
in 2003. Now, keep in mind, there's probably at least 2,500 to 3,000 parole hearings a year. And so, you know, that's maybe 15,000 parole hearings, eight people went home. So, of course, you know, word, word gets around that nobody's going home, and it definitely kills the morale of the convict. You know, the convict may have been married, may have a girlfriend, may have uh, friends, you know, but eventually, once they realize he's not coming home, you know, either they start dropping off, may, maybe start passing away, and all these things, of course, plays a a damaging, a damaging effect on, on the person serving the time. Now, of course, I know you got a lot of people out there saying, well, hey, man, you guys shouldn't have did what you did and stuff like that. And if you feel that way, hey, I have no hard, I have no hard feelings against you. I'm just giving you the scenario of what's going on in prison. You know, uh, I can understand on both sides of the coin. Um, then also around 2008, the California voters voted in um, what was known as Marcy's law. Now, by me having life for an attempted murder, when I first came to prison, the, when I did get the chance to go to my parole hearing, the longest they, I could have got a one year denial or a two year denial. So after that, two years was the longest that they could, they could deny me for, then I would have a chance to come back to my parole hearing. But now when they voted in this Marcy law, um, now that allowed the parole board to deny a person for three years, five years, seven years, 10 years, or even 15 years, depending on um, his program in prison. If he had been staying out of trouble, the accomplishments that he made or the accomplishments that he hadn't been making. So now imagine, imagine waiting 15, 20 years to go to your parole hearing and you get a seven year denial. You get a 10-year denial. I even seen a couple of dudes get a 15-year denial. Some of those dudes were uh, using drugs. They got caught with a syringe a couple of times, stuff like that. Nevertheless, a 15-year denial after you've served 18, 20 years, 25 years, that's a whole nother sentence. Even a five-year denial when you serve 20 years and 15 years and you don't even know when you go back in five years, if you're going to get out, and you probably have, have taken the mindset that you're not going to get out. That's extremely demoralizing to a person's psyche. And so those are just part of the reasons that contribute to um, all the violence in prison, you know, um, the losing of hope, things like that. You know, then keep in mind, everybody in prison don't have life. But when you're doing time around all these dudes who you feel don't care, uh, I mean, either you have to. You have to get on that same mind state or you have to roll it up or you have to be quiet as a church house mouth. You got to do something because when you're around killers who are killing and they don't care, um, what can you do? You know, you can't worry about getting home until you get home. And so uh, that was the mindset that I took. Like I say, being a small dude from a smaller town, you know, I felt that all I had was my reputation and I had to stand up for myself and do whatever I had to do in order to survive. Now, I'm no, I'm no, uh, no, nowhere near or by any means the bully or nothing like that, you know, so I'm, I'm a small guy. I'm not even, that's not even my type of mentality. But like I said, at times you have to do what you have to do, man. And uh, that's, that's the cold, that's the cold thing about prison. Um, you know, uh, so after, 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 um, after Pete Wilson, it was Governor Gray Davis, man. And uh, I, I think, yeah, I think I told you guys, Gray Davis, he paroled eight, eight people in five years, man. And he, he denied 98% of the cases that came before him. And so, you know, and uh, that's, you know, that's a cold situation, man. Uh, I'm just looking over here at my notes a little bit, man. Um, and so, you know, but some of the things that was instrumental in helping me get out, eventually they voted. They also voted in the law, what was known as a a uh, youth offender parole hearing. And basically what that was, it was saying that if you had been given a life sentence and convicted as an adult under the age of 18, you were now eligible for a youth offender parole hearing. And where that came from, I guess they did some type of studies and they said that the brain doesn't fully develop until the age of 25, especially the parts that's, that help a person with impulsive, uh, impulsive decisions help a person um, be more compassionate, help a person be uh, more mature. All those things that others didn't de fully develop until the age of 25. So 
if you were convicted and tried as an adult, you were now eligible for a uh, youth offender parole hearing. Initially, it was at the age of 18, but then they extended it to the age of 21 and then eventually bumped it up to the age of 25. So I happened to um, be charged with my crime, I believe, at the age of 21. So I was eligible for a parole um, uh, um, uh, uh, youth offender parole hearing, which, which was extremely monumental in me gaining my freedom. Now, before all this stuff came into play, I was, uh, when it came time for me to go to my parole, the first parole hearing, I postponed it for a year. Now, you may have some dudes out, and, and then, okay, I postponed it for a year, and then when that year was up and it was time for me to go again, I postponed it an, an, uh, another time. So now you may have some people saying, well, damn, man, what the hell is going on, chill? You had a chance to get your freedom. Why were you postponing your parole hearings? Well, you have to understand that at that time, lifers were not being uh, granted parole. Thinking about going to the board was the only thing that made me, uh, that gave me anxiety. You know, it was, it was extremely mind boggling and it just, it just, you know, it, it was something that threw me into a funk because it would make it made me realize how much power and control I had gave someone else over my life. So I'd, I'd be looking at my court transcripts, all the things pertaining to me going to the board, and it would just it would stress me out. So I just throw the stuff back up in the box that I kept it in. And I dealt with that situation by not dealing with it. You know, I tried not to keep things like that on my mind. So um when it was time for me to go the third time, some of these new laws had been voted into play. So I wanted to go to my parole hearing now. Plus, back then, you would never see a person go to his parole hearing on the first time and be found suitable. Uh, when you go to your parole hearing, the deputy commissioners, they're going to tell you the things that they need, that they want you to do in order to try to uh, uh, attain your freedom. And so I wanted to go and get that stuff out the way. Unfortunately for me, when it was time for me to go back the third time, I was in the hole. We had got into a riot, and I talk about that with uh, with the Compton and Watts car. So the public offender that they had appointed me advised me not to go. He said, due to the fact that you're, you've are you been in trouble and you're just coming out of the hole, um, I believe they're going to give you a lengthy denial. Five, seven year denial, possibly. You know, me, I was adamant about going. You know, he, he advised me two or three times. They, they come meet with you maybe like a few months before you actually go. So on the day that I actually went, he came and advised me again. He said he thought it was in my best interest to uh, request uh, a postponement. Now, there happened to be a dude who I'd always see in the law library. He was, another, he was, he was also another lifer, and he, he, he happened to be there as well. And so he asked, I asked him if he thought it was smart if I would if I should postpone my parole hearing and come back later. Since I always saw him in the law library, he said, yeah, he thought that uh, it would be wise if I postponed it also. So when my lawyer came back out to talk to me, I told him that, yeah, I did want to, I wanted to uh, change my mind and, and postpone my hearing. So when he went back there to talk to the uh, district attorneys and stuff, the district attorney was, he was arguing against it because he said he felt that if I came in, I would get a long lengthy denial. So they was unwilling they were unwilling to give me um, give me a postponement for a year. So now the only thing that they would agree to is a five year denial because he said he felt that if I if I came to my hearing, I would get a longer den a denial, possibly a seven or a 10 year denial. And so unfortunately for me, I was forced to take a five year denial. So at that this was 2011. So at that point, I've been in I had been in prison um what is that? Maybe 15, 15, 16 years. So like I say, imagine doing all that time knowing now that I'm not even going to come back for five more years. And so uh, that was a, a predicament that I had put myself in. And so, uh, yeah, that's what it was, man. So, I, you know, I took the five year denial. And so uh, since then, though, they have created now where if you go to the board, you get like a five, seven. Even I've seen the person get a 10 year denial. And still, now you can request what's known as a uh, petition to advance your hearing. So um, you get the five or 10 year denial. Um, you, you go back to the yards because now they also have a lot of self-help classes, anger management, conflict resolution, um, drug classes, 
all the victims awareness, all these different type of classes that the board likes to see us take and also see us, you know, not only take these classes, but understand a little bit of these classes and be able to explain and give some insight on how we can use this stuff or how certain things affected us in the past. So so you take a couple of these classes, you stay out of trouble, you can't get in, you can't get into any trouble and then you submit one of these forms to have your petition advanced. And, and have your hearing advanced. And I've seen several dudes get lengthy, length, lengthy denials and still be home in about two years. And so uh, at that time, they didn't have all that stuff, though. So now it would make no sense for a person to 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 even postpone his hearing like I did, because you can still go in there. Like I say, get a three year, five year, 10 year denial, whatever, and stay out of trouble. Um, do the petition to advance your hearing and go in there. And so when you go, when you go in front of the parole board, like I said, it's going to be a commissioner, a deputy commissioner and uh, the district attorney. The district attorney, uh, 99 times out of 100 is going to argue and oppose your release. Of course, I have seen in a few rare instances where the district attorney doesn't oppose the release of the dude going to going to uh, going to his hearing. But most cases, he's going to he's going to oppose it. Um that was another thing that was messed up back in the day that a lot of the people who are on the parole board were appointed by the governor. A lot of these people would be former cops, wardens, uh, sheriffs, stuff like that. One lady was even appointed. I forget her name, but her brother was murdered. So, of course, she's already going to have a bias against a person coming in there. And so eventually, uh, <coughs> excuse me, eventually. All this, you know, this whole process was changed, revamped. A lot of these uh, commissioners who had high rates of denying people, they were removed from the board. And so these things are some of the things that was instrumental in helping myself and others get their freedom. You know, I'm always asked, like, chill, you know, uh, you have in life, how, how were you able, how were you able to come home? And so these were some of the ways that I was able to come home. Also, though, when you go to the board, like I say, they're going to ask you and question you extensively. Sometimes it's an antagonistic questioning, trying to see if they can rattle your chain. You have a lot of convicts who go to the board and they think that that's an opportunity to retry their case. And that's where they go wrong at. You know, basically, when you get found guilty, you file an appeal. You know, those that appeal goes through a few different courts. And once a court affirms your conviction, for the most part, that's what the parole board is going to believe. So you can go in there and you can say, well, no, I wasn't in a cutlass. I was in a regal. It wasn't light blue. It was it, it was it wasn't light blue. It was gray. You know, you can maybe um, you can maybe like uh, make clarifications for the record. But for the most part, if you go in there and you're argumentative, they're definitely going to deny you because you have to realize they have their they have your life in their hands. But unfortunately for some convicts. They can't see through that. They can't see that, you know, because as convicts, a lot of us for a long time, we've had um, attitudes about don't say anything that could be seemingly cooperative with law enforcement. So, you know, what you can also go in there and do is just say, hey, you know, um, I'm submitting that everything they have in the record is true. I'm not arguing about any of that stuff. And I'm, you know, I'm not speaking on the case, but whatever they have in the record, I'm agreeing with. That's that's another avenue that you can take. But basically what they want to know is who you were when you committed the crime and who you are today. And so basically, uh, when you committed the crime, the answer is this. Hey, chill, who were you when you committed that crime? Well, I was a selfish, uncaring gang member. I was a person who felt that I had the right, I was entitled to um, be violent towards people who disrespected me. Or however you want to articulate it. You don't have to be no genius. You don't have to go in there and sound like you're no scholar. You just have to be able to break it down and talk about the character defects that helped or contribute to you doing the things that you did. Then they will ask you, well, who are you today? Well, today I'm a law-abiding citizen. I respect others. I believe everybody has the right to live, so on and so forth, you know. And uh, those are the type of things that will help a person be found suitable. So for those of you guys out there who may have family, who may have loved ones doing uh, doing life sentences, Definitely tell them to keep their head up. You know, it's always a, it's always a chance to gain your freedom. Nowadays, um, as a lifer, 
um, coming home is more in your hands than it has ever been before. You know, real quick story. I know a friend, man, who, who was in prison at this time, maybe about 30 years when we had talked. He had got locked up. It was him and two other friends who had committed a crime. Both of his friends, and they all got life sentences, had been gone about 10 years when I was talking to him. They, they told him, hey, man, stay out of trouble. Next time you come back, we're going to let you go. He showed me this in his transcript. So he comes back to the yard. In about two weeks, he gets caught smoking weed on the yard. Of course, they write him up, all that type of stuff. When he went back, then later on, they caught him with some wine. When he went back, they gave him another five-year denial. So unfortunately, some people can't get out of their own way, you know. Initially, when I came to prison, I had no hope. But once I'm on the yard, maybe around 2010, 11, 2012, I'm seeing people who I've been on the yard with for 10, 15 years go home. That gave me, of course, an incentive to stay out of trouble. You know, I knew dudes who had came to prison for a murder and had caught murders in prison and still was found suitable by the parole board. I've seen people who came to prison for a murder and had several stabbings and was found suitable. Years ago, that would have definitely been an automatic denial. But like I said, things were more fair now. Um, and so the uh, the chance for a person to go home is in his hands more than ever now. Also, they always ask me, well, Chill, are you still on parole? No, I did two years on parole, and uh, then I was let off parole. So that's another thing about um, Parole in California now, as opposed to how it used to be maybe 15, 20 years ago. The parole officers now, they're not looking for uh, reasons to intentionally violate you, to send you back to prison. They have a lot of programs and stuff to help people on parole successfully, com successfully complete parole and be a productive citizen. So if that's what you want to do, then uh, it's, up, it's up to you and it's in your hands, man. So you already know what it is. It's your boy 16 to life. Resume normal program.